The COVID-19 pandemic is triggering some familiar feelings among Americans of a certain age. They've been here before. Our cover story is reported by Rita Braver. Sorrow, fear, hospitals overwhelmed, closures, all due to the deadly coronavirus and all hallmarks of another deadly and mysterious virus that terrified Americans starting at the turn of the 20th century, polio. One huge outbreak in New York City, June 1916. Panic soon begins. Those who can pack their bags and prepare to leave town. Thousands hurry toward the piers and railroad stations. As Walter Cronkite recounted in this 1958 CBS News broadcast, that was just the beginning. After World War II, polio became an ever greater national threat. The three-year statistics run 50,000 polio cases, 103,000 cases, 122,000 cases. Where will it end? What were your symptoms? High temperature, pain, headaches. I could not move. I couldn't stand up. Joanne Yeager was a healthy 14-year-old in Denver when she got polio in the summer of 1951. She would spend three months in the hospital before the disease started to retreat as mysteriously as it attacked. Like COVID-19, polio had different effects on different people. It left Jaeger with permanent weakness in her legs. Still... Did you ever stop and think, wow, a lot of kids died from polio? Yes, and that was brought home real quickly because on the same floor that the ward was on were the iron lungs. Iron lungs were primitive respirators, breathing for patients. Like COVID-19, which strikes older adults more frequently, polio had a greater impact on a vulnerable age group. One of the things that tugged at the heartstrings of everyone is that polio, for some reason, targeted young kids. Carl Kurlander spent 10 years researching and co-producing a documentary about polio. The fear, my friends, is polio. He says one pivotal adult was left paralyzed from the waist down, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who would later become president. When did Roosevelt contract the virus? When he was 39 years old. Roosevelt helped launch the organization that came to be called the March of Dimes. Dimes pour into the White House to help the fight. All in an effort to curb this dreaded disease. With polio, there was really no effective treatment. So it was really a sense of helplessness, probably like we're feeling today with coronavirus. The March of Dimes helped fund a groundbreaking effort. This is the place, the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. This is the man, the director of the Virus Research Laboratory, Dr. Jonas E. Salk. Jonas Salk and his team spent six years working on a vaccine, conducting a huge nationwide trial on 1.8 million children. The most extraordinary field trial in medical history. And no one knew whether it was safe, whether it would be effective, but people were so both afraid and believers that they'd volunteer their school kids to be guinea pigs for this new vaccine. But in 1955... One of the greatest triumphs in medical history is achieved. Success. History is very important to understand. Dr. Paul Dupre, who holds the Jonas Salk chair and heads the Center for Vaccine Research at the University of Pittsburgh, says the march of history gives today's scientists an advantage. We can manipulate, we can alter the genetics, the composition of these viruses in ways that Dr. Salk could only have but dreamed. Jonas Salk, of course, had competition. Dr. Albert Sabin developed an oral vaccine a few years later. Now, Dr. Dupre, who's trying to adapt the measles vaccine to combat the coronavirus, is one of scores of researchers around the world all working toward the same goal. Competition is something which drives innovation. But there's another C. We need to be collaborative. And that's not just colleagues in the United States, that's colleagues all over the world. 
The FDA just approved an emergency treatment for COVID-19, but the greatest hope is for a vaccine. Dupre and his team are already testing theirs on mice. And elsewhere, human trials have begun, several already showing great promise. Do you feel that the public is really behind scientists in the way they were behind those looking for the polio vaccine? I do. I think it's hard in an instantaneous world that we live in. Everything needs to be done yesterday. It's hard to be patient, but I think strong leadership, clarity from scientists, it helps the public understand that we are doing our best to defeat this virus. Neither Jonas Salk nor Albert Sabin and their teams personally profited from their discoveries, as Salk explained to CBS's Edward R. Murrow. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the people, I, I would say, there is no patent. This is, could you patent the sun? <laughs> 65 years later, with polio all but eradicated, it remains to be seen if the creators of a coronavirus vaccine will feel the same way. As for 83-year-old Joanne Yeager, who still lives with the effects of polio. What lessons do you think we can learn if we study the polio epidemic? That we can be survivors of some of these illnesses and we can come out as better people. Historian Carl Kurlander. We've got to have belief in the scientific community. Joni Mitchell and Neil Young had polio, Francis Ford Coppola, it's Doc Perlman, and ordinary people, once they came through this disease, they were able to really become the best they could be. And I think that we're at our best when we work as a country and as a world to defeat the unseen enemy.